Hi. Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, well, this book has a really interesting origin. Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, that we, Hillary and I want to thank Julia Glass for introducing us many years ago at the Brooklyn Book Festival. After Julie introduced us, um, about seven or eight years ago, Hillary and I were sitting at a French bistro in Brooklyn, and we were talking about how much we love to read stories about sex and erotica, and how we love the classics like D.H. Lawrence, Anais Nin, and we wondered why we weren't seeing like some of the gr great contemporary writers today sort of really diving in and writing explicitly about sex. And we thought, well, how great would it be if we invited some of our favorite writers, some of the best writers in the world, um, to to write about a story about sex in a, for an anthology that we would put together. And we thought, well, how do we persuade them to do this? Um, because they might not do this normally in their own books. And, um, and so we thought, well, well, what if we obviously have the stories in the book and we list them, but we don't say who wrote which story. So this, the book will be called Anonymous Sex. Yes, and uh, Cheryl and I got very busy writing novels and that was probably what, eight years ago. And, um, you know, when I would finish a book and say, okay, let's do this, Cheryl would be in the throes of writing her book. And so we didn't do anything about it until the pandemic. Um, and last June of, no, June of 2020, excuse me, um, Cheryl was in lockdown in her childhood bedroom in Singapore. I was um, alone in Brooklyn in my tiny little apartment and in Maine. And we uh, were talking on the phone. We were Zooming one night at midnight, her time and noon, my time. And we're like, why don't we do this now? Um, this is just, a, the world could definitely use some good sex right now um, at a time when, of course, we're all so estranged and cut off from each other. And, um, and we, we, we needed some creative inspiration. So uh, we talked to our agents, they liked it. And then we, we decided, um, we would just start writing letters to people. And our first invitee was Julia Glass. And um, she was a very enthusiastic yes. And from there, we just built our list and put, put together this amazing uh, roster of artists. So we're just thrilled um, to have everybody on board. And I don't wanna go on too long because I wanna get into the, the thick of things. So we're gonna start with um, a few micro readings, one to two minute readings. Um, each author is gonna pick something from the book may or may not be his or her own story. And we're gonna start with Tony E. Prow. Hey, thank you. I am reading from 58 times a year. The average married couple he has read fucks 58 times a year. It is early December and by his count, they've barely broken a baker's dozen. He knows this because every time they have sex, he enters a little corncob emoji in his laptop journal. It, was, it is less obvious than the confused eggplant. The last corncob was more than a month ago. He is clattering home on the A train on the way back from a quick after work drink with the guys. Sitting at the bar, they teased him about his wife. They read bits of her recent op-ed aloud to him, called it the vagina monologue, vagina diatribe asked him if he needed his dick valet parked, if he'd remember to leave his balls at the coat check on the way in. Just good natured bar banter. It means nothing, no harm, no foul. He will endeavor to end the drought tonight. Add another corn cob to his fuselage. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we're gonna have Julia Glasgow next. We're, we're going in alphabetical order. Thank you. Uh, I am going to read from the middle of a story called Find Me, which might be subtitled Strangers on a Train Without Murder. And uh, all you need to know is that a young widow named Eloise is traveling by train across the country from New York to Reno, Nevada to make a marriage of convenience. The reading light was still on when she awoke to a screech of brakes and a jolt that sent the hairbrush flying across the carpet. The train screamed and clattered to a halt. Raised voices filled the air. Through the window, she could see two men with flashlights running toward the front of the train. There were popping sounds, two, then one more. Gunshots? She heard the heavy carriage door clanging open, the sound of running footsteps down the corridor, then the door at the other end opening and whooshing closed. 
She sat up, groggy and confused, hastily pulling on her dressing gown, tying the sash at her waist. Again, the whoosh and whine of the carriage door, this time from the front. Footsteps approached, not hurried, almost hesitant. It must be the porter, she thought. She could ask him what was happening. She went to the door to open the latch, but just as her fingers turned the steel dead bolt, the panel jerked abruptly from her hand, slid halfway open, and a bear burst into the compartment, knocking her to the floor. The creature yanked the door closed and lurched across the bed. As it surged past her, she felt the cold rising from the luxuriant fur and heard more running and shouting outside the train. The bear flicked off the light, and the moonlight flooded the bed with a pearly glow. She lay flat on her back on the carpet, utterly confused. Was this a dream? The bear turned its head, looking back at her. I really have to thank you for not screaming, it said. Of course, it was a man. The bear was a coat. The man had black eyes, long, straight black hair. How improved relations between the sexes might be, Eloise thought, if every man began his acquaintance by thanking the woman for not screaming. I love that passage. Thank you, Julia. Uh, I think I'm up next. I am uh, reading from a story called This Kind. I'm going to read from the beginning, but this story is about a woman who is cheating on her wife with a, with a man. She came to him when he asked her to come to him. It was night, the security gate lowered halfway. She went under, her hair catching in the metal slats. The shop looked different at night. The stacked slatted racks that held bulls and braided loaves were empty. The baskets for rolls and knots turned over. The dark room smelled warm, yeasty, with a lace of cinnamon and almond. Forgive me, she said. I don't know why I've come. I don't belong here, she said. I'm not this kind of woman. He sat her in the chair and got on his knees. No, he said, you are this kind. Let him try, she thought, and she closed her eyes. She could go on this way. He worked at her, his mouth moving against her. She found she'd get there, just there, to an edge, almost beyond that edge where she wouldn't be able to hold. But then, with the slightest shift, pulling back a little, she kept herself at the crest, not cresting. And the more insistent he became, the more she refused, could hold back, and wanted to, the greater his resolve. She opened her eyes and saw the shape of the two of them slurred against the metal wall of ovens. Am I killing you, she said. He looked up smiling. Are you trying to? And now we have S.J. Roseanne. Uh, thank you. I'm going to read from the beginning of a story called Rapunzel, Rapunzel. Her hair, her hair, for as long as she could remember, it had been all about her hair. When her father tucked her in at night, he kissed her head and said, a woman's hair is her crowning glory, and yours will make you a queen. When her mother brushed it, gliding the boar bristles through it with exquisite gentleness, so as not to break a single strand. She said, your hair is a precious gift, more valuable than gold or jewels, and you must never, ever cut it. Adults cooed over it and other children yearned to touch it. Rapunzel endured their unsettling attentions, standing politely while their grubby fingers stroked it like they would some shy fay creature they feared to startle. They never imagined that she herself was such a creature and that all she wanted to do was flee. In fairness to them all, Rapunzel's hair was glorious, as soft and lustrous as mulberry silk, and wondrously variegated, shifting with the light and the seasons from the palest ash to champagne to honey gold. By her teens, it fell in luxuriant ripples to the tops of her thighs, and boys felt the urge to grab it in their fists and yank on it, laughing at her shrieks of outrage. A few years later, the young noblemen they became begged for locks of it and wrote odes to it, penned in feverish script on curled sheets of vellum bound in red satin ribbons, comparing it to the wings of 
nectarious birds and fields of ripening grains, rivers of molten pewter and other equally ridiculous substances. Thank you, SJ. Um, and I guess I'm up next. I'm gonna read from story number two in the collection. It's called um, Asphodel. And the, the wonderful thing about this book is that we have stories set everywhere, all over the world, in the future where there's holographic sex, in the past. Um, and this one is set in the afterlife where a lot of things are possible, apparently. It was windier out there. In fact, the wind, it seemed as though it wanted to play with Adeline. A volume of air slid along her skin, slipped inside her coat, warmed against her throat, raked down her nipples and hovered over the most exquisitely sensitive places on her body as she wandered along. Every so often it seized her hips, pushed itself between her legs, so she had to stop laughing, then gasping as it turned heavy, hot, solid, and sent a rush of sensation through some new central nerve that she hadn't known about. She froze against a tree, waiting for the blinding trance-like joy of it to pass. At last, the little tendril tendrils came out of her neckline as a rosy flush, a delicate whisper of air, and she lay down to sleep. Her bed was yearning emerald green moss. When she awakened, Adeline found that the moss had grown around her. Now it began rubbing her, vibrating lightly as it peeled away each piece of her clothing, making sure that without her covering, she was still warm and comfortable. It made a blanket of tiny moving fingers that explored her all at once, then gave beneath her when she turned over and decided to see if the penis worked. A soft, thick-walled, narrow, deep aperture opened and she pushed inside, once she did, she was lost in the plunging and bucking and hurting. Yes, it hurt. Or she was hurting something she could also feel. And the confusion drove her out of her mind. She couldn't hold a thought, felt she might disintegrate. But there was no use trying to correct what was happening. What was correct here? Maybe she was doing the right thing. She kept on and on, sliding in and in, nearly passing out when it gripped her, falling forward where it, when it loosened and allowed her deeper. Then so deep, she felt she'd maybe slid entirely inside and would be lost. But no, thankfully no, she must have been doing the right thing because eventually there was a shudder of light and bolts of continuous glowing tension that consumed her, shook her like a rag and dropped her spent in the tender moss. If you wanna read more, you're gonna to have to buy the book. And now we're gonna to go to uh, Jeet Tile, all the way, um, joining us all the way from Bangalore, India where it is 5.45 in the morning. Thanks so much, Cheryl. Um, I'm going to read from uh, a story titled uh, How I Learned Prayer, which transmutes uh, the religious experience into the sexual experience, as one does. When I was a kid, whenever it was time to pray, my mother told me to close my eyes and press my palms together, but never said why. I figured maybe it was a symbol for those who were to be counted by the Lord in case he returned during 11 o'clock service. I also figured it was so I could imagine God tiny and trapped between my hands. This way, I could hold him close enough to hear me. Sometimes it made me feel like I was doing something. Most times it made me feel silly. But at this altar, the altar of Misha Ferndale, though my body was folded, nothing about me was meant to be closed in such a moment of reverence. There was nothing small to be captured in this hallowed space. Prayer was happening to me, happening in me, around me. Prayer was standing in front of me in panties. Thank you so much, G. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was great. I, I loved hearing all of you do the readings. And now remember, we may or may not have been reading from our own stories, so um, because everything's anonymous. Now, we, Hillary and I have a bunch of questions for you guys. Now, was this your first time writing explicitly about sex? And if so, what was that process like? How did you approach that? Did you approach that differently from how you usually work? Did you have any surprises? Did you go about writing the story differently? All right, well, I'll start. So, um, you know, I don't think in, in the end th that I wrote any differently from the way I usually do, except that for the very first time, sex had to be front and center. And I think that was actually sort of a block for me. I thought, I can't believe I agreed to do this. And as you know, Cheryl, you very kindly gave me an extension because all my stories begin with characters. So I had to 
but I felt like sex was this large kind of looming boulder. And then, but once I got the character and I understood that the story was actually going to be, you know, it was going to touch on the same themes that all my fiction does. And, you know, it was going to have more sex because it was going to be about sex in this character's life. But um, I think the only thing I ended up doing was that I used some anatomical nouns I have never used in my writing. <laughs> and they looked very straight, you know, I'd type it and go, no, I can't use that word. And then, you know, but, um, but I did, I thought I'm a big girl, I can use that word, so. I, um, that's interesting, uh, Julia, that you said it, it ended up being the same as, as what you've written, because I have, there are a couple of themes that, that I, work on all the time, whether I mean to or not. Um, it just, the stories come back to that. Um, and I, mine turned out that way also. Um, but also I, I thought, well, this story isn't about any, it, it's about this situation, but it's about the situation in sex. And so um, I, I didn't approach it differently. Although I did have that same reaction, I can't believe I agreed to do this. Um, but once I started, I knew the whole story. I, I, I knew everything in, in a lot of short stories that happens to me, it just blooms all at once. And it was a question of making sure that I didn't um, pull down the shade and then pull up the shade, which is what I usually do when I'm writing um, about sex. Uh, so, that was that was the only difference for me. I don't know that I will do this again, um, but but I found it um, uh, enlightening. So, well, it did make me wonder why I wasn't writing more about sex in my stories. Although I'm tempted to say it just didn't come up, but um, <laughs> of course, everything we say now is an innuendo. Um, I. I think the big difference in doing this particular piece, uh, which I can't say more about, um, was making sex much more front and center, very much like, uh, like Julie was saying, that uh, there just was a lot more of it in a much shorter space of time. What about you, G? Um, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think most, I think the thing I enjoyed the most was um, writing about sex elliptically and also never using the pronouns one would expect, you know, especially if you're of a certain vintage and you've grown up um, reading so-called erotic fiction in the 20th century, uh, you know, the, the kind of words I'm talking about. And it, I, I realized that actually when you don't use the uh, expected kind of uh, you know, language, it becomes far more interesting uh, uh, to read and to write. Um, next, we'd like to ask a, a question that one of our, one of our uh, audience members is asking that we, we also wanted to ask, which is, did you write differently knowing that your name was not going to be on this? How did the anonymity factor in for each of you? No. <laughs> I, 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 if I had agreed to do an erotic anthology with my name on it, I would have written, I think, probably the same story. Um, it did not, I, I, I might have agreed to this book because it was anonymous. But um, when I, if, if, if I am outed, if we're all outed and people say, oh my God, you wrote that story, I will say, yeah, I did. And, you know, I did. You know, my, my attitude was anybody who wants to find out something these days can find it out. So I was very amused when Cheryl, Cheryl, I think you said to me early on that some people were very nervous about people finding out that they wrote the stories. And my attitude is I hope that people are passionate enough about this book so that they really, really want to find out and that they do find out. And then that's fine by me, as long as my mother doesn't know. <laughs> just from 89 today, so. 
I did not tell her why I had to leave early. Oh, I have to, mom, I have to go be on a Zoom event about a book I'm in called Anonymous Sex. I did not tell her that. <laughs> G, Tony. Um, I have to say, I, I, it really didn't make um, much of a difference at all, in fact. Uh, you know, except the, the fun, at, fun factor. You know, I, I, I like this idea of not owning it for a year and a half or whatever the period of time is. And uh, eventually, of course, like murder, it will come out, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody will know. And uh, that's just, it just makes it tastier and more delicious. And it's just such a pleasure to be part of this process, really. For those who don't know, uh, we all had to sign, all, each author had to sign a contract with Scribner saying that we would not reveal uh, which story we wrote for 18 months. Um, af after that, who knows? But we know of several people who say that they plan not to. Um, but in any case, I, I, I think I've emailed all of you on this list when we were discussing your story and the whole process that if you were to say, you know, which story you wrote in 18, in, within these 18 months, I would have to fly to wherever you were and cut you. So <laughs> that's all stands. <laughs> Tony, what about you? Yeah, eventually, sorry, eventually when we do take uh, when we do own our stories, I'm sure what we might tend to do is to own each other's stories. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, I, I, yeah, which one do I want to lay claim to? Um, I like to think I wouldn't write any differently if it were um, not anonymous. And I'm not someone who worries too much about how other people respond to my thoughts and to my uh, my words, although... I you know, try not to hurt people's feelings, but um, I, I said sort of only half jokingly to Cheryl once that this makes you more invisible to the bullies. And I think there's a real strength to the whole collection that there is this anonymity that we get to partake or have our, our whole group, 27 of these terrific writers um, being there to kind of take the rap together or um, sort of be, be having each other's backs. And um, I, I grew up in South Africa with my father as the editor of uh, an opposition newspaper. And um, he talked a lot about the impact of censorship on um, not only directly on a paper, but on what it does to your mind, because there's self-censorship that happens where even though you might often be standing up against censorship, um, at the same time, everything you do becomes a question of like, is this worth getting fined, sued, put in jail for? Is this worth, you know, people on Twitter flaming me? Is this? So I think one of the, the things about this um, anthology, which I love, is that it really manages to obviate that question. And going back to something that Jeet said, um, the emphasis that right from the beginning was to have fun. And that I think has been so great has been a rediscovery of fun in writing. And we, and, really, and we really hope that it would be a rediscovery for readers because mm -hmm. you can come to these stories and only judge what's on the page. You love it, hate it, but it's not about who the person in writing it is, what their politics are, what they, you know, what they do as a hobby on Twitter, we just approach the stories pretty much the way we used to, um, which is, is it a good story? Do I like it? Does it draw me in? And, um, and, and we hope that uh, readers have fun with that as well. And it's, a, it's been a really pure reading experience in that sense, I think too. And also it's been fun for it to, to have people guess. And of course, when people guess, we can't say if you're right or wrong because that is an answer in itself. But, um, but yeah, I'm sorry, SJ, you were about to say something? No, 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 no. No, I was actually, oh. I just, you know, Tony, what you said is so profound. I'm almost hesitant to tell this silly story, but I've actually already been outed and this is how. So, um, and, and Cheryl, you, you might have to, to go cut him, but um, <laughs> I think I, I told you. So when, when the, the beautiful lush red galley arrived and was sitting on my kitchen table, it so happened that my 25 year old son and his girlfriend were here and they were like, oh, mom, you know? So I, <laughs> he, he and his girlfriend picked up the book and he said, oh, we're gonna figure out which one it is. 
So they read out loud all the titles and they, they canceled all the titles that seemed way too cool for me to have conceived of, narrowed it down to a certain group that had titles they thought I might be capable of creating. <laughs> then the girlfriend read out loud the first few sentences, like each of those words. They did this in this totally scientific way, absolutely horrifying to me. And they guessed. There was a clue that my son saw within the first couple pages. And, and I'm like, nope, nope, not mine, not mine. Like, and I was as red as, as the cover, but I still, I said, you can't tell your father. So um, we're pretending that Dennis doesn't know. That Cheryl doesn't know. Like well, that the, the interesting thing is our editor at Scribner um, asked to read it blind on first read. So she, she wanted to, to, to guess as well. And, um, and she knows a lot of your work and, and has read your work. And, um, and, but when we finally gave her the list of, there are very, very few people who know who wrote which story and she's one of them. Um, and uh, she actually managed, she actually only guessed two out of 27. Uh, and we were all kind of surprised at that. So I think that it's a real testament to how much people really wrote outside of their usual box. Um, we had a writer at a panel uh, earlier this week who talked about how she was deliberately sort of, sort of concealing her usual style when writing when writing her story. And I think that a lot of people set story, they, men wrote from women's perspectives the other way around. Um, you know, like we, we have, you know, we have writers who, who set stories in countries and places that you would not associate them with. So I think if people actually knew who, who wrote which story, they might be kind of surprised. Um, I wanna quickly answer a question in the chat, which is somebody asked, someone says, 350 pages by 27 authors doesn't give you many pages. Did that help or hurt the process? Um, actually, we gave our authors uh, the parameter of writing between 1,000 and 8,000 words. If they had all turned in 8,000 word stories, it would have probably been a much longer book. So we weren't limited in any way um, by our publisher as to what we could publish. Um, and, and as it turned out, we lucked out because we have longer stories, shorter stories, um, it, there's diversity in that as well. So uh, we, we weren't constrained in that way. Um, and, and we were ahead. sort of worried um, as the stories, before the stories came in that, because we really hadn't given any parameters that we would end up with say, because Hillary and I each have a story in it, we would end up with 25 stories about the same thing or 25 stories set in the same place. But the stories are really all over the world. They are all about everything. There's all kinds of sex in there. There's teenage sex, there's ghost sex, there's holographic sex, there's sex in the afterlife. Um, you know, there's sex in, in, uh, in, uh, in China, in Hong Kong, in France. Um, so it, it really, it would be really, I feel like we kind of lucked out in terms of length and also um, the variety of stories because each story is really unlike the other. Okay. Hillary and I have another question. Um, you know, for has writing the story changed the way in which you might approach the writing of sex in future books? Yeah, well, I think uh, I think one thing I, I could certainly say to that question is uh, when when writing about sex in a future book, um, I doubt if it's going to be quite this. Um, Kind of communal and uh, a part of a you know process in which you're together with other writers and it's going to be back to business as usual which is sitting alone in a room with your demons it's funny because one of our other writers from the beginning took to calling this the uh good ship hms anonymous sex and and <laughs> it kind of felt like that at times that we were all sort of on this ship together sailing off into the unknown um and we're so glad that we have you guys on board yeah, I, I like I like that the HMS anonymous sex, and I like what Tony said is that you know as a group, um, it it sort of deflects the bullies. Um, when I what I said before about you know being outed, well, it sort of doesn't matter because you read these twenty seven stories, and they're all about sex, and one of them is mine. So you know I, anybody who thinks I don't write sex. They're wrong because clearly I do. Um, whether I'll do it again, you know, whether um, whether this will change how I approach sex in my books, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I don't think so. But I do think I might. Um, it, I might get more explicit in short stories mm -hmm. um, now that I, you know, have had the the experience. I might not. It's it's an interesting question. But uh, 
but I'll see. Yeah, and for hey, so, me, I, oh, go ahead. I just wanna say something about this, the communal experience and feeling like I'm part of a very cool club. I really wish Cheryl and Hillary that we had been entrusted with one another's, you know, knowing which stories we <laughs> wrote if, and sworn to secrecy for one another. But, you know, I know that writers are not really trusted with secrecy. <laughs> hey, loose lips sink, sink ships, right? Well, writers I, are the last people I would trust in this. <laughs> you're, you're so right, but I still I'm like, damn, I don't get to know who wrote that story. Although we, we we did break the rule with in one instance because there was one writer who really loved another writer's story and chose to read that writer's story. And really, and so I pass on that information to the writer, the person who wrote the story. And this person said, you know, it's really all right if if she knows who it is. And so that was this sort of secret love fest going on between these two people. And, and they were like, oh my God, I love your book. I love your book, whatever. And so that was that was nice. But So we broke the rule once. If you really would like to know something, we can discuss it. There can be a price. Um, on a more serious note, I'd like to ask all of you at a time when we're seeing book banning and stuff like that happening um, in various places in the country, do you think it's important to write about sex? Maybe I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I really do think that's the case. I think that um, also, again, going back to just one of the strengths of this book being writing freely, kind of uh, torpedoes be damned is really vital to what we do as writers. And I, I think most of us try to do that, but again, it, it is a reminder that those there is that insidious effect of the the worrying and also the effect you know it has on the publishers. So, you know, if you decide to write from the voice, you know, we have a ghost sex story. If you decide to write from voice of a ghost, is your publisher going to say, you know, we're worried about the ghost lobby? They're not going to like you uh, writing about being haunted this way. <laughs> um, I definitely think that it opens up a little the dialogue of of just. Uh, and I encounter this a lot again, teaching of people becoming really worried about causing offense. And I think there's been um, a wonderful increase in consciousness of the, the problems that arise out of the, the certainly issues of like the literary equivalent of blackface and the kinds of issues that have arisen out of that. But I also think as writers, it's uh, really important that we, we write about the full spectrum of, of human experience um, and counter the kind of literalism that seems so prevalent today. There's the failure to recognize imagination exists. And that's what we're all about. I mean, we're all here because we, we love to use our imaginations. I mean, what a, what a sad and absolutely boring world it would be if we were to listen to that thing that they tell you in MFA programs, and that is, you know, write what you know. I think that's probably the worst advice you could give a writer because the point about writing fiction is that you try and inhabit somebody else's experience and someone else's mind. And if you're a, a woman and you can't write from a, a man's perspective or the other way around, that would really be a, a bereft kind of poverty stricken world for uh, fiction writers to inhabit. I always say that if, if we only wrote about ourselves, we'd have an entire canon of literature about uh, lonely alcoholics with poor social skills and carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing that we get to write outside of our own experience because um, it would be pretty boring if we couldn't. And, and you know, Tony um, reminded me that I'm actually, I teach in an MFA program and I find that uh, students are very afraid of offending one another in terms of sexuality and gender in particular, but the truth about sex and it's not a beautiful truth. I mean, you know, sex can be an, ex you know, an extraordinary um, transcendent and, and as, as Ajit was, you know, has alluded to, you know, in, re in the prayer, talking about prayer, um, even kind of a religious experience, but it can also be a very brutal out of control experience. And I think, you know, it's important 
for um, if you're writing about human nature to write about the full spectrum of what sexuality represents in terms of human behavior. I do want to make a plug for also uh, sex being funny, along with being potentially brutal, and uh, which I completely agree with you. I'm not trying to undercut this important statement, but one of the things I love about the book too is the sense of humor that runs throughout the entire book. Yes, and, and I actually, in, in writing my own contribution, I, I wanted to use humor as well. Yeah, yeah I, I think that um, writing about the full spectrum of human experience does include writing about sex. And I completely agree with Jeet. And I can say this because it's not about my story. It's about the rest of my body of work. Um, I am uh, routinely writing from two points of view, uh, first person points of view that are not me. And um, I, I, can't, um, I can't kind of get my head around what would happen if I, if I weren't allowed to do that. Um, I, I just, I think that would be, it would be a loss for me, certainly, and you know, possibly a loss for readers. I, I would, I would, or at least the, the principle behind it would create a loss for readers. The whole point, as Tony said, is, is imagination. And if we're not allowed to use that and to use that in writing about sex and, and sex, to look at it the other way, sex is about the entire spectrum of human experience from, from tenderness and, and religious transcendence to brutality and humor and idiocy, um, just, just and, 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 and things not working. And it, it, it's just like everything else in life. And yeah, I think it's important to write about it. I kind of think it's important right now to write about everything that's being banned. Um, everything that, that all, the, all the books that are being banned I think we should each write, you know, five or six books just like them. Um, but that's, you know, something else. Now, um, for Hillary and me putting this collection together during a pandemic, we started um, working on this book, even though we had this moment of thinking about the book seven or eight years ago. It wasn't until summer of 2020 that we sent out the first invitations. Um, and putting this collection together in this time was really kind of something that saved us in a way because it was a, such a time of intense loneliness. You know, we couldn't even hug people for a while. Um, you know, a lot of us were craving sort of the, the things that we, you know, just holding someone's hand or being around somebody physically. Uh, what was it like for you writing this story in the middle of a pandemic? I know SJ, you have said in previous interviews that it was a little bit, it was surreal to do this in a surreal time. And and Julia, I, had, I laughed out loud when I saw a quote that you gave to, uh, in, to, uh, in, in Elm magazine where you said I felt about as sexy as a turnip during this time so it was, <laughs> you know but what was it like for all of you um you know working on this working on this very intimate story at and during this pandemic I, I'm just thinking about having sex with a turnip um, <laughs> I you know it's it's an interesting question I I approach the story as I would anything but the time was so surreal that would the story have been different if we had written it at a time when we could make contact with each other and hold each other's hands and you know have anonymous sex if we wanted to or, or whatever i that's that's a good question and and knowing my story i would have to say it would have been different i would have written a different story if i hadn't felt so um, so like I was living on Mars and not sure how I got there and not sure how long I was going to be there. Um, so that I, I'm not sure that's a clear answer, but, but that is what well, I have. To I wonder about the rest of you, because in addition to not feeling very sexy, I was not feeling very creative. Um, you know, my writing dried up and, um, especially during those early months of the pandemic, and so for me, writing this story was like the first fiction that I had written in months. And the fact that it was erotic fiction and that it could be playful um, really kind of helped me sort of get back into doing what I love to do um, in a joyful way. Um, I don't know if any of you guys had were creatively blocked during the pandemic, but boy, I sure was. 
I'm, I, I could respond to that. I'm not a writer of short stories. I write novels. And when I um, said yes to Cheryl and said I'd like to be a part of this, I thought I'd, you know, write the story and, and work it into the novel in, that I was working on in some way. But of course, that became absolutely impossible. And it, it's now a story on its own. And I guess I'm going to have to write some more stories and eventually think of a collection of short stories. So I'm just so glad that this uh, invitation happened and I said yes to it. Yeah, okay. you know, me too. I mean, I also, I too am a novelist and, and really don't write short stories. Um, and so I was sort of doubly blocked, A, by the pandemic because Hillary, like you, I really, was, I mean, I had a novel to finish and I did it, but I did it in a kind of boot camp like way like I kind of like okay you're gonna do this you know it was it, it, I don't want to say it was joyless that wasn't true but it was I had to be extremely disciplined and then I got up to last it was actually just a year ago that this that I wrote this story because I was really under the wire I think our deadline was February 1st or March 1st and I you know I just kept putting it off and you know actually one of the things that lit a fire under me this is going to sound really pedantic but I got an invitation to schedule my first vaccination shot. And I thought, you know, there's hope here. And I have no excuse, just stop moping. And, and, and I also, though I didn't have any illusions um, that I would fit this into a novel, it was, the story was inspired by a novel that I, you know, had worked on. And, um, and so, it was kind of like a little cul-de-sac that might have come out of, of a novel. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, but I, but I felt like that, that was like, as I like to say, there was a glimmer of hope and then a glimmer of lust. <laughs> I think for me it was, um, it was just a really nice reminder of what got me into writing fiction in the first place, which is taking myself into a different place in time than the one I was, was, in it at the writing. And also then it's great to have a deadline as well as someone saying, but you better have fun with this because whenever I would be in touch with Cheryl, she's like, well, make sure you're enjoying it. Make sure you're having fun. So, <laughs> no pressure, uh, have fun. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> have fun, but it's due Tuesday. <laughs> right. Have fun, but not too much fun because I want it by 24 hours from now. <laughs> yeah, the flogging will continue until morale improves. Exactly. <laughs> That's a whole other kind of story, Hillary. <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry. It's endless. The, 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 the innuendo is just endless. Um, you know, just, yeah. How many of us actually went down to the wire on this or and had to have, am I the only person who had to have an extension? <laughs> Uh, 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 no, no, but but very very few people ask for extensions. So um, you know, and actually one, and, and we had one writer. I won't name the person, and it was it's wonderful. This is a testament to how great this writer is. Um, had written the story, was about to turn it, in and said, "Wait, this the, the this this is part of the novel that's coming out before the book," and so she, and I was like, "Oh, we're not going to get this person in this book after all." And this person said. Don't worry, I'll write you another one and turned one in in two weeks and it was it was wonderful. It was perfect. So um, yeah. Well, we have a question from the audience. Um, it's a craft kind of a craft question. How do you get past the initial cringe and embarrassment about writing about sex and worrying about getting on that getting one of those bad sex awards awards over in London? <laughs> what if we want to win one of those bad sex awards? No, I have a confession. <laughs> And Cheryl, I don't think you know this. I was a finalist for the Bad Sex Award. <laughs> um, and my publisher, when they wrote me, said, we're not going to sure how you're going to take this. And I'd never heard of it. And for those um, who don't know, the, the Bad Sex Award is a British book award that was founded by Auburn Waugh of the Literary Review. And I'm reading here, with the aim of stamping out gratuitous sexual intervals in serious fiction. The award's intention is, quote, to draw attention to the crude, tasteless, often perfunctory use of redundant passages of sexual description in the modern novel and to discourage it. However, you know, there's a whole ceremony, there's a statuette that apparently depicts 1950s style sex. I have not seen a picture of it. 
Does that have to do with Jello? I don't know. The year that I would have won it, and of course I desperately wanted to win it, the award was presented by Courtney Love at some military club in London. But I lost. So I want you to know that some of my fellow finalists were David Mitchell, um, Thomas Pynchon, and Will Self. And none of us won it. It went to Ian Hollingshead that year. So I was the only, I, I think very few women are ever up for it. So you know, go me, but it, it was utterly bizarre and improbable that I ended up. Is, is that because women write sex better than men? That's right. That's right, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Except when we're writing about characters who've had recent head trauma and have synesthesia, which is what I was doing <laughs> sex for the first time since having developed synesthesia, so. Anyone else? Any any tips? I, I it never crossed my mind. I mean, I my my cringe came long before that at the oh my god, I don't believe I agreed to do this stage. When I I said, you know, okay, I'm gonna sit down and write a erotic story. I am, um, but then once I decided I was, I I um, there was no cringe at that point, and and. It didn't occur to me. I mean, the, the bad sex award did not occur to me as as something to um, hope for. But you know, we'll see. I can just see the the uh, the um, whatever board gives that award. Um, you know, grabbing this book and lustfully and and holding it to its uh, bosom. Um, so we'll we'll see. Maybe we'll all get nominated. Maybe the book will get <laughs> nominated as a whole. Yeah. You know, a, a postscript to Auburn Wall, he was Evelyn Wall's son. And uh, the thing about Auburn Wall is he was this uh, failed novelist who, as failed novelists do, ended up being a journalist. And I was very interested by the, uh, the wording of that passage that uh, Julia read out. And it, it, it's so interesting that he used the word redundant because half of that a paragraph of prose is redundant. It's so <laughs> journalistic, you know. So I think even if you were to win, uh, if this book were to win uh, that award, I think it's uh, it might be an idea to think of it as a badge of honor. I want to address one thing because since right before the uh, conversation started, the uh, Center for Fiction mentioned talking about craft here. And I think one thing I was really aware of um, during the writing and in my own other writing are where there are uh, sexual intervals. What do they call them? Gratuitous intervals, according to <laughs> Oberyn Waugh, um, is to try and avoid that uh, kind of Ikea manual um, presentation of sex that, that winds up being, you know, what goes where, when, and how. And I think that's that's often what winds up making the writing of sex start to become um, a little bizarre you know, or, or just strange is that the kind of detailed uh, kind of anatomical descriptions are the, become a real problem. And um, I think also in the New York Times review mentioned avoiding certain words like the, the gasping and throbbing words, um, you know, he gasped, she throbbed, she throbbed, he gasped. That there they weren't there. There was a single throbbing member in the book. Throbbing member. Oh, yeah, no throbbing good. member. Throbbing. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one is reminded, I mean, the cliches uh, of sex writing are also, they're so readily available. And so that's, um, you know, part of the fun is just thinking, okay, how do we do this differently? How do we write about this differently? And, um, you yeah, know, without being, completely self-conscious about it. Well, and to your point, like we all know where the parts go, you know, like there's not that many places they can go. So it, it's really about the feeling around it, what the person is, what the character is experiencing um, versus that. And, and one of the craft ways that I um, used was to read it all aloud. Um, and if you're cringing when you read it aloud, and, and boy, I caught some real clunkers, you know, by doing that. Um, and that and that really helped. Um, 
but yeah, I, I definitely wrestled with certain terminologies um, before kind of, you know, deciding where I wanted to go with that. Um, I'm, we have we have another a question that's related to craft too, but um, but it's it's not entirely about sex, but we can make it about sex. How is writing fiction? Uh, this is from Sachin in Indiana. How has writing fiction changed for you over the past few years? As the real news has become so outrageous that it feels like fiction. Hmm. Yeah, well, especially you know that's a question you really have to grapple with at some point. But I think uh, possibly less now than in during the reign of Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, at least it isn't a daily kind of wave of just unbelievable information. And it is difficult for a fiction to compete with that. Let's just hope he doesn't come back, in which case we might be out of jobs. <laughs> yeah, we'll all become we'll journalists. We'll become journalists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Reporting on it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I think that that was a, um, it was a much bigger problem for uh, thriller writers and humor writers because they, humor especially, uh, people yeah. could just not keep up because yeah. there, there's just everything we would have said, oh, that's ridiculous. And then it just kept happening. For, for those of us writing um, fiction that is not, related to absolute is not absolutely tied into uh, current affairs. I think um, it's I, my writing, I think, got a little more subtle as the world got more um, crass. I, I may be wrong and it may have gotten more subtle because I was getting older and, you know, getting better at my craft. But uh, but it, it also seemed to me that that the need to hit readers over the head with a hammer um, had receded as the world started doing that. I have to agree it would be harder for the um, science fiction writers and the humorists because just the things that are, the absurdity levels um, rose so much. I do remember one of my favorite uh, South African comedians, uh, Evita Bezadenhoek, Peter Dirk Ace, you said, part of uh, their most successful act was simply reading from the government gazette. Um, I think um, we're, we, we're running out of time. So I, I think we have time for one more question. And Hillary and I have been wondering, um, you know, real quick, like, you know, what's your favorite, some of your favorite erotic literature? What would you recommend? Um, we, we love that we've been sort of creating a little reading list based on all these, our panelists' recommendations. And, and what do you think makes for good erotica? Uh, I'd say uh, right away, Anais Nin. I, I remember her, I mean, talking about a great writer of erotic short stories, those, uh, the stories in Little Birds. Um, uh, in fact, some of the passages in, in some of her novels as well, just so beautifully done because uh, she never used the kind of words that, uh, that we've been talking about. There's, there are no throbbing members anywhere there, you know, and uh, it's, uh, but at the same time, it's so deeply erotic. And I, I think uh, she's just a, a great model of, of how to approach erotic fiction, at least for me. I want to talk about actually an old friend and a wonderful writer who I don't think many people know. Um, hold the book up. It's Lynn Luria Sukunik. Uh, this is her posthumous collection. Um, called Danger Wall May Fall. And she wrote a number of stories for, there was a unfortunately short-lived erotic literature journal called Yellow Silk. Oh, I remember that. And uh, she wrote a number of stories from them. The stories are just beautifully written and um, also again, filled with, with some terrific humor. And uh, one of her stories, I, I love this, just the small details in it, that there's a scene where a couple are spent spend an entire week in bed together in the uh, the man's maiden aunt, uh, spinster aunt's house, and the last line of the story is, the spinster aunt had insomnia for two years following and never knew why, <laughs> and she just writes writes beautiful work, and that, that's I'll put the I'll put the name in the chat, so happy to give give that a shout out. 
Um, for me, it was Lady Chowderly's Lover. That book has come up a lot. Um, and I discovered it when I was probably 13. So it was very interesting indeed. Um, but I think he writes, it, it was just very eye-opening. And because Lawrence writes so differently about sex than anything I had read before and so beautifully. And Julie, SJ? Um, Dracula. Dracula, vampires are all about sex and Dracula is about sex on every page. Um, and I just, when I read it as an adult, when I read it as a child, I didn't get it at all. When I read it as an adult, it knocked me over. So um, I would, that is my, my favorite work of erotic fiction. <laughs> I, I wish that I, I, did I know we were going to be asked this question? <laughs> you know, 15 minutes after we get off, I'm going to be so mad that I didn't think of it. But, you know, I don't read a lot of erotica. I mean, certainly when I was 13 and working in the public library, I was constantly sneaking in the stacks and reading, you know, uh, Portnoy's Complaint and all kinds of things. But that's not, you know. Um, I will say, though, I, I haven't read it in a long time, but I think a book that made a great impression on me as, as a young adult was, was Mrs. Caliban by Rachel Ingalls, um, which, you know, I, I am a firm believer that, that The Shape of Water completely ripped off Mrs. Caliban. Um, and I think, you know, it's more about, I'm more interested in fiction that treats sex very liminally. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm more turned on by yearning, I think, you know, by, by longing and pining and, and, um, and not so much the, the full on act um, in, and I don't know if that means I'm one of the, those New York Times prudish readers or, um, it, it, and actually it's been eye-opening for me to be reading this anthology because I don't read a lot of fiction that is, is you know, that puts sex center stage. So maybe it will change my, my reading tastes if not my writing style. I, I want to throw out one thing there responding to you, Julie, that's, um, for me, it's often desire, mm. which I, relates to yearning. I mean, desire is yearning and sex joined together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you, know I'm, very, you know who's very funny and, and sometimes quite darkly funny about sex, I have to say, is Alan Bennett, mm -hmm. you know, the, the British um, playwright and, and, and uh, novelist. Um, he, he has some extremely sort of wickedly, darkly comic pieces to do with sex. What about you, Cheryl? I, I like that sort of yearning space with regard to sex and sexual relations. Um, you know, a lot of it, there's a lot of poetry, like Japanese poetry um, that I that I love. Um, in the in, in the front of the book, we have uh, Ono no Komachi. Um, and, um, and I like a lot of uh, work like that. And in fact, Ono no Komachi herself is, is quite inspirational. She was a she was a woman who had many, many lovers and uh, wrote wonderful poetry. And uh, and I highly encourage you to, to read her poems and, and look at a look of her life from like, you know, centuries ago in Japan, um, because she's a kind of an, a really interesting character. Um, and I, I guess on that note, we're we're just over time, but, um, oh, it's Ono no Komachi. Ono no Komachi, um, Christy, Christy, someone is asking in the chat. Um, but, you know, you, you could find out how to spell her name if you um, buy the book, because <laughs> we, we have a little poem of hers in it. Um, but uh, Hillary and I want to thank everyone so much for taking the time to be here. Um, all of you are really busy um, and all the, speaker, all the speakers are really busy, but I think as SJ said, when Jeet came on, he gets the hero award because he woke up at five o'clock and uh, five in the morning uh, in India to be part of this conversation. So everyone, please uh, look up their books, buy them, buy Anonymous Sex and read their work. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to our hosts, the lovely folks at the Center for Fiction. Thank you all. It's a great conversation by the book. It's so much fun. We'll see you all again soon. Come visit us in Brooklyn. Thank you. Bye, everyone.